Good evening, hello, welcome everyone. Thanks uh, for coming to today's celebration of new poetry publications. I'm John Smalley, a librarian at the main library here in the humanities department on the third floor. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community and to tell you about a couple of our upcoming programs. On behalf of the Public Library, we want to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. So as you know, April is National Poetry Month and we've been having quite a few programs. There's one more this month, uh, this coming Sunday, 6 p.m., I'm sorry, not 6, I believe it's 4 p.m. Uh, in this very room will be a celebration of the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal, 44 years of vital verse. Yay! They'll be presenting some of uh, the city's finest bards. Also, if anyone is here for the first time, uh, we have a regular poetry reading series, poem jam series, uh, curated by our host tonight, Kim Shuck. That happens the second Thursday of each month. Uh, and next month, June 13th, we'll present writers in the latest issue of the multicultural lesbian literary journal, Sinister Wisdom. So we hope you will return for that. You can learn more about our programs by picking up a flyer from the table on your right or one of the library's newsletters, or by visiting our website, sfpl.org, the events calendar that is online. So that's all I have to say by way of announcements. I will now turn the mic over to San Francisco's poet laureate emerita, Kim Shuck. Please give a warm welcome to Kim. Thank you for being here. Um, I had this whole thought and it just went right out of my head. I've been having a lot of allergies this last couple of weeks and I'm a little ditzy, so forgive me. Uh, I'm really happy with the collection of poets that are reading tonight. They're some of my very favorites and um, I have a lot of favorites, but but these, these folks are really spectacular and I feel like it's always healing to listen to good poetry, so thank you for attending. Our first poet tonight is Tanish Kaur, who um, we were just reminiscing about when we met the first time and she she had been recommended to my online open mic that I host by our mutual friend Paul Corman Roberts. And I have been waiting for her new book for some time because I have had to sort of catch as catch can collect individual sheets of her poetry up until this point. And so I'm, I'm really delighted to introduce you to or to remind you of or just to welcome you to listen to Tanish Kaur. Please give her a big hand. I think it's probably safe for me to say that you're one of our favorites as well, Kim. Um, so this book is called Thawing, and it was like um, kind of a delve into memory. Um, so I'm just going to read the first couple, like the first section. Um, 2020. In those primitive eyes of lies lying in a rocky bed, of decades worth of face first, flailing, falling. I developed a frozen smile, a peculiar kind of depression. It grew wide with a sadness simply seen in my irises, flecked with energetic fields of pain, searing my occipital lobe, numbing my familiar fear, a denial for my family who never had hope for me. Glimpsing my entire life, haunting effigies of my revenge fantasies, myopic, cycloptic clearings of cataracts into microscopic visages, 
in tunnel vision, each face inducing, inducing a flashback, lasting hours, sometimes days, exploding a ethereal pus, confronting unwanted ghosts, guests in the quest to find whole. While hold up, the world stops and turns as I live in the past, the vastness of grief, hoping one day to thaw into the future, the bright, the bright beauty of hindsight. Will it come? Will it? Will it? So I, I think um, I don't need to do the trigger warning, because maybe that's a good indication of what's to follow. Um, and so yeah, I think I'll just keep going. If these clenching muscles could talk. Time passes. You release memories. Hard edges, sharp shapes that prick, pierce, retreat, repeat. Over my right bicep, slices down to the elbow, contracts my hand into more of a claw. Muscle memory. Knitted into incidents hidden inside pain, sharpening with age and denial. The muscle memory, the incidents, the pain, all lose incisiveness with awareness. Reach farther, open the door to your brainstem, let the light in. You can see the courage from your gut and love in your heart and all around you. Only the truth will help you now. Only the truth will let you know. Remember what happened. Remember. Does she even see you when she looks back at you? On those rare occasions, reflections in her eyes, you see sunlight sometimes. If you're lucky, if the mood is right, if it pleases the crowd in her shadow, of, where, of how well you've behaved, always according to her judgment, the air impure and scarce, the amount varied, but always in her shadow, barely, just barely. You too can live only to inhale if you crack your ribs and pop capillaries, the more the better just for her, just a handful enough if you puff hard for what's left for you of her fingertips and toes of the very last vessels nourishing her blood down the throat, lungs expanding all of the air there sucked into a funnel for herself first already, she who has taken more than enough, the wake of another human being's exhale. It wafts down toward you to take it in so thin you gasp, climbing up there where the air you breathe, to do right, to do everything right according to another, an insurmountable mountain, the pressure. Um, and so this, this part is more like prose, so, um, um, so yeah. <laughs> um, when we were younger, my sister would humiliate me in front of her friends who always came over, she'd ask in front of everyone why my belly button was so fucked up, and they'd agree. And later, a few years later, she saw it again and accused me, what did you do to your belly button because it looks normal now, and they'd agree. She'd kick me off the couch with her legs and smother me with a pillow, wrestling me around, and I'd yell for help and gasp and think I was going to pass out while her friends sat there and I'd wonder why they didn't take a stand. She and I, we developed this phrase for getting up. It was, get my place back. And one time I was on the coveted three-seater and went to the bathroom with that phrase leaving my lips. But when I came back, she had taken the three cushions from the couch and made a bed with them on the floor, and so the phrase became, get my place back and everything on it, GMPB and EOI for short or for long, and she never did it again, but we always said the new phrase. 
for my seventh birthday. <clears throat> my sister taped it, then, ele then 11, and I opened my presents and was so happy until I discovered a few days later that she had taped over it with the Belle Biv DeVoe poison video. Oh, thank you so much. I love it turned into. It's driving me out of my mind. And I screamed and cried, was made to look like a brat, the scapegoat, but my mom was still alive and made me, my sister tape me opening them again, and I was happy. In Kentucky, the girls, us four, were in my cousin's, her room. She must have been 20, and we didn't let our boy cousin come in. We locked the door, and I felt like I was part of something in some kind of club, just one of the girls, and I left to go to the bathroom, and they wouldn't let me back in. At first, I thought they thought I was him, but I explained it was me, and one of them inside said, go away, and they laughed, and I left to join the boys. I was nine or 10 cast aside with the boys. We were supposed to stick together, but they had more fun together, excluding me. My sister in there said nothing, which was typical of her. My sister and cousin used to call me into my sister's room and they'd put pillows stuffed with hard things above the door, and as I entered, the pillows would fall on my head. I was five or so, and I'd laugh and keep going back in. I remember she and her cousin, the same one, would lock themselves in the bathroom, and I would knock on the door because all I wanted was to play with her, and she would do her best deep whispering voice saying, this isn't your sister. This is fake Didi. Didi in Punjabi means sister, and it would scare me, but I didn't believe her. And I followed her around the neighborhood, wanting to hang around her. And all she did was humiliate me before and after my mom passed. I do remember fun times, like our home videos. We reenacted the Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan saga, and I was Oksana Bayul's interpreter. We did the iconic Michael Jackson Oprah Winfrey interview on our snow days off from school, and my sister was Michael Jackson and said that she, he lived in Santa Ana Ranch dressing. She was funny in a mean way, but sometimes just funny. She would make this voice about oysters and pearls and clams, like clams don't make pearls, oysters make pearls, but clams, no and how I was the most flexible. I had been in gymnastics and we reenacted some of the photos of the cheerleaders in their junior high yearbook on the last day of school. And I was held up by, my, by both my legs in a split position, but I kept farting and they set me down and we all laughed, but I did wonder why farting was so gross. It was actually a natural thing to do in that position. Um, Thank you so much for listening to this. Um, I just have, um, uh, how much time do I have? One more, okay, so I'll, I'll close with this. Um, so this was like definitely an exercise in memory and it like, it hit me so much, like it, it was very difficult to live for several years um, and so like, I found myself having to like work through and, and find myself again with all these memories and it was just like uncontrollable and so that's sort of like what this book is about and so I'll just close with a poem. Um, no, she does not. The pressure, an insurmountable mountain to do everything right according to another. Up there where the air you breathe so thin you gasp to take it in. It wafts down toward you the wake of another human being's exhale. She who has taken more than enough for herself first. Already all the air there sucked into a funnel, down the throat, lungs expanding, nourishing her blood of the very last vessels of her fingertips and toes. What's left for you? Just a handful enough for if you puff hard, the more the better just for her crack ribs and pop capillaries only to inhale. You too can live just barely. 
barely, but always in her shadow, the air impure, the scarce and scarce, the amount varied, always according to her judgment of how well you've behaved in her shadow. If you're lucky, if the mood is right, if it pleases the crowd, you see the sun sometimes, reflections in her eyes on those rare occasions when she looks back at you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Tanish Kaur. Our next poet, um, the first time I ever heard her read was in and it broke my heart. Such a beautiful language for poetry. And uh, uh, we've read together a number of times since then, and, you know, it's, uh, it's always a great treat. Please welcome to the microphone, Manaz Badihian. especially these Thursday events, which is very uh, useful and good and necessity. Uh, before I start reading my two poems, uh, they're new, I never read them anywhere else. I'm reading them tonight. Um, just wanna say that uh, on May 11 in Beat Museum, I have an event called Roomy Night. Uh, you don't have necessarily to read Drumi, but we are, and I also invited a musician, a Kurdish Persian mu uh, musician. He's fantastic. So everybody welcome to come and hear us. And also now I'm going to read a ghazal from Hafez. Hafez is a god of ghazal from 8th century. And his poetry is so beautiful, so rhythmic, that is impossible to translate it. We can only translate it and say, what is the meaning? Not translating the poem. So with all the things going on right now in the world, all the negative things, I just went to Hafez and I asked Hafez, Hafez, how should I feel now? What's going on? And Hafez was very positive. He said, Nafase baud sabo mosh fashan khawad shud. Aulam peer de garbare javan khawad shud. Argavan jam agiri be saman khawad dod. Chishme narges be shagayik negaran khawad shud. In tatawul ke kishid az kame hijram borbor ta sara parde gol. So the meaning of this beautiful rhythmic poem, oh, uh, by the way, us Iranians know his poems by heart, majority of us that love poetry. One of them was my mother. He was just walking around the house, kitchen, and read the ghazals, and that's how I actually memorized it. So it says, the morning breathes its fragrance with exhale, the old world will once again become youthful. So it's so hopeful. Tulip will bring a red cup to the meadows. Narcissus' eyes from poppy will grow pale. Love not joy of the now till the tomorrow, meaning live now. Don't wait for tomorrow. We don't know what happens tomorrow. And enjoy the moments that you have. OK, the two poems that I have, I'm recently going through my 10, 15 notebooks that I have hundreds of poems, really, that I haven't even looked at them for, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years. And I'm going through that. And this is one of the poems that when I lived in uh, Marin County, from the window of our house, I could see Tamil pyres. Uh, and also the ocean. So um, I worked on this poem uh, this week, prepared for today's reading. So the name of the poem is Tamil Pious. Uh, do I need this? Maybe. <laughs> we need more lights. Something. Oh, this is. Excuse me. I think this is dying too. Okay. From behind the large kitchen window, 
that overlook the sea and autumn hills of Tamil Pires, the sky is cloudy and its tired breath, breath or down from the rainfall that has paused. The city lights still resembles a small blossom of fire on the mountains, beautifully distant. And every moment, fresh vein of light awakens the sky. The house is so captive in silence that in the fireplace, the tired sound of the last song of burning wood is heard, and it feels good. That it feels good, yes, thank you. One more line from this poem. The weather is melancholy, and my voice is like the sleep of puppies. Okay. The second poem and last poem I'm reading called my reflection. I am endeavoring to mend the frayed threads of my existence by being like a dove, emblem of liberation, like a steadfast dog, lawyer through and through, like a universal tongue inscribed on a sky and the sturdy limbs of poplar trees besides the creek of my childhood home. My heart unfolding to new love, like a window yawning towards the sea, I shall be enchanting in my reflections like verses penned by Hafez. In the inaugural week of spring, I shall emerge in you, dazzling as fresh blossom, poppies in attendant fields. With a fresh perspective on life, I blossom as a growing bud in the lush expanse of existence. I shall craft memories of blissful harmony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Always so beautiful. Thank you so much, Manan. <clears throat> Our next reader is uh, Dena Rod, um, who. Now I can't even remember the first time I heard you read, but it was just you just blow me back in my seat every time. The work is incredible. The, um, the dance of the words is incredible. And uh, basically, I could listen to this person all the time. Welcome, Dan Arado, to this microphone. Thank you, Kim. I think he was actually here at the SF Public Library uh, where I first heard you read. <laughs> so it's a lovely full circle moment. I'll be reading some poems from my book, Scattered Arrows, which I'll have available after the reading. And this poem is called For Persepolis. My body is a temple set in a wasteland, armored with mirrors for camouflage. My body is a wasteland and a temple, a possession so prized, a Trojan horse of people came to invade and ruin me, filled my insides with powders, oils, flowers, and wines, drunk deep from my ceremonial cup dusting the dead with laughter, shaking columns down, crumbling plaster. Still I stand, a heritage forbidden from the future, wiped from the cartography of record, as my ruins scatter cracked mirrors to reflect the rot outside. I've been thinking a lot about how 
memory lives in the body and how memory brings truth and also a question of if that truth is a neutral truth or just your truth. Um, this poem is called Tasbi. It's after um, the Islamic prayer beads that I remember seeing um, my father and his friends have in their hands, but they weren't religious, <laughs> but they still carried them with them. Tasbi. My father's tasbih had green beads of a chartreuse that I've never found in any other hue. Its green was lighter than the Heineken, than, than the bottom of the Heineken bottle he would lift up to his mustached lips, but not as fluorescent as the peak of saffron-soaked rice mountains my mom would steam in the kitchen. Translucent beads, soft and frosted as sea glass, thicker than a grain of rice, but just as long, made a soft, gentle sound rubbing against each other, smoothing the surface of the bead next. Seeing it in my father's hands, you might call it a rosary, but he didn't pray, not to Allah or to anyone else. Maybe he prayed to himself, Maybe the worn viridian threads knotted between each bead encapsulated the knots he couldn't untie within himself. I never understood what these beads meant to my father, only that they were important and provided a comfort that couldn't be found elsewhere. My father's taspi consumed his worries as he rolled the dice of his backgammon silently on the Persian carpet, dice in one hand, taspi in the other. And when the beads came alive, when light filtered through, reflections danced over his calloused thumbs that worked the copper wires inside of a lighting fixture during the day. When I was small, I coveted his taspi. He lavished his attention on, and I watched him from the split in the door frame as I laid on my bed wondering, what was he thinking about as the square die and oblong beads caressed his skin? What does he say to himself in place of al akbar as the repetitive motion of gleaming silky beads stroke the calluses of his hands? Last year, my aunt gifted me my own taspi, round, large red orbs, a glossy ripe red, like a fresh stiletto manicure, weighing heavy on its thin threading. This is a decorative one, my mom told me, and the message was clear. This wasn't one meant to run your hands through with the weight of your worries, but one meant to show your status in a society my parents left. I haven't seen my father with his taspi in years. I wonder where it has gone, along with the color in his mustache and the light in his eyes. Was it another thing he lost along the way to making everyone else happy but himself? I'll leave you with one more poem also about my dad. <laughs> This one is called, Is This My Name? I text my dad, is this my name? That is, my name in Farsi I cribbed from Wikipedia because my namesake mountain is the first result, but not on Google. I text my dad, is this my name? Because I never learned, and we gave up on that spiral blound blue notebook decades ago. The Farsi never sunk into my brain, and I text my dad because I don't want to be one of those Americans with a mistranslation on their body. Yes, he texts, this is your name, right to left. He texts, this is your last name. He texts, here is your mother's name. He texts, Here's your father's name, that means his. He texts, here is the name of your father's country, which means this one isn't his. Like the third party keyboard hack I know he's using to tell me our names because Apple doesn't sanction our language in their iOS. And I wonder, how much longer can he translate for me? 
One day he won't be there to tell me where we come from. And until then, I text my dad. My name is Enarod. Thank you. So here's a funny thing. <clears throat> we seem to have settled on a theme for tonight, which is memory. And um, I find that really interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that if I set a theme for these readings, people get as far from the theme as they can <laughs> and still be sort of in eye line with it. But the other reason is that... that uh, I've always said you can always make a line, a straight line, with any two poets, and the trick is to do it with four. It's much harder. <laughs> you end up with these polygons. Um, but I, too, am going to read some memory poems, and I decided to do that way before I heard any, what anybody else is going to read. So um, I'm going to repeat a thing about the work tonight. Uh, that everybody's got books. Not everybody has books right here, but you should take them out of the library or buy a copy because, um, you know, poem locally. I find it fascinating that when I'm having allergies, I can either breathe or think, but not both. <laughs> you take the... The antihistamine and it just dazzles you. This is from Pick a Garnet to Sleep In. I love the every direction power word spit cold into the face of this always storm, but I can't afford the cry song. The next cry song, something that curled up around the dust he kicked when he evoked us and then declared us gone. I'm not gone. The young man asked me if the rock I carry in my heart, the one handed over with a lineage back to initial invasion, the one with a chain attached that threads through continued occupation, the one that's hooked to every disappeared relative, every murdered bone of every uninvestigated someone's child, does your rock get too heavy, auntie? Yes, it does. It gets too heavy. Just now when someone who should be an ally declares us gone in eloquent and delicious words, and I think for a second that maybe we are, but catch myself, my aging and practiced balance asserts, and I remember, nephew, the rock gets heavy, and to carry it I have to cut other things away so that you don't have to shoulder my share. Thank you. <laughs> What hour is this for a car to slip like a seal over the hill? Lights cut at the window, striking raindrop shadows. Sky Creek, finding level. Finding the echoes of wounded knee of the numbers we roll around in our symbols of pen. We can't find rattle of thinking, rattle of mystery hours in suspended time of year. A pendulum knocking over one more peg unwatched every year. That image, death by someone else's fear and the trailing connections of questions we think we've been answered. How often the word wall, wall, fact, and scattered family, scattered wall, stone, tumbled, kitchen table, revolution, postponed. A stone, not from a wall, one that fits the hand, and once I might have thrown it, I might have thrown it, but some windows are paper and won't shatter, won't shatter. Family, the web we cast between us, the school we make, the knots we tie, the numbers we decode, the revolution of soup and acceptance. The breaking. When they tore apart the sacred trees, some of you are thinking Ermansol, and some are thinking the cherry trees in front of the cultural center, yes. I thought about every small thing destroyed to make a point. And now I think about the petroglyphs. We saw them in that hot evening there in the trees, gone silent. And for now, the memory of being there hidden near the state road is held by more than me, no less sacred. And after we who have seen are gone, 
in photos. And after the photos fade, that story will be different, like every missing woman, like every grandma kicked to death, like a bullet through an apartment wall and a legacy of breaking. That story will be exactly the same after all. <clears throat> um, feeling sorry for myself about feeling icky. Turned on my computer, and it turns out that uh, um, a young rapper in Iran who has been standing up for women in that place has been sentenced to execution. So people ask me sometimes if I think poetry is important. I don't have to think it's important. They kill us for it. <clears throat> the people have been called this or that, this or that by tongues who couldn't say us, by politicians, historians, anthropologists, were made small to fit in a shadow, a shadow made small in boxes under a desk, the cast of my teeth the professor asked for, not a student, but something else, something else. The people blamed for ice age, age extinctions, but we haven't really been here very long. We're thought of as in pieces. We're thought of as history defined out of existence as something else. Today, we're testing the idea of representation, blue dots on the sidewalk, caravans slipping traffic bully politicians, voter intimidation. Today, we're reviewing the experiment. <clears throat> this is the one I was looking for. My hero poets are leaving, not all at once, not everyone, but too many, too fast, too often in these last two years, and here, on the days some people called summer's end, I was shivering at my kitchen table. I was shivering and watching the storm cloud over San Bruno Mountain. I was thinking about my hero poets, danger of poets, fearless poets, and one of them sent me a poem just now, like a very sharp knife between someone else's ribs. And I'm not even a little cold anymore. <laughs> there are about five people at the back of the room who totally get my sense of humor and giggling at that. Inappropriate. They didn't give us a day. We pulled it from this resisting calendar. Grandma went back later, wise and experienced, with a digging stick to get the root, just in case. How do we make a day last a year? Now there's a miracle to recut into ceremony. I walk February, May, December afternoons with my pockets full of October days. One for each of 50 plus years. They whisper to my grandfather, to my dad, to my cousins. They whisper, yes, you are here, you are here, and these stories matter. <clears throat> this is actually for QR Hand who some of you will know about, and others of you will have to go take the book out of the library. Pull on a different mountain range, one leg at a time. You time travel in poem, he told me. I've seen you do it. We went relic spotting more than once through the lineup of the 53 Dodgers before his heart was broken, before his heart was broken. Memories never sit as neatly in a prong setting as a heart solitaire. Memories don't sit that neatly. Is this where your tattered banner hangs? Taken by the freeway weather, like feet slipping between chill sheets, like hope song of no dreams. Have you, have you heard the music, the music that didn't hand you a memory, feathers in a left hand, feathers and tremble, moth against glass, banner, wound into chain link, wound in wild weaving like feet, sliding over unfinished floorboards, an idea of floorboards, a slow polish. Step and step, bringing up the grain, tree life written in dark ridges, dark ridges the night foot can't read. Have you heard the music, the music that keeps your memory, 
Is your banner hanging there, woven into the metal webbing over the freeway? <clears throat> I think this is going to be it. I don't know. You can hunt the sky in the strange place you rent that isn't home, where the inside of the cupboard is painted the color of despair, the thing you were really looking for. Because some poet looked out the window and saw a bat god in the city skyline, and another would rather be a demon than feed one. And that sense of well-being you feel will be called delusion. Call it delusion. Make it a pet. It'll curl against the backs of your knees at night and keep you warm, no matter how many times you say, down, off. But secretly, you can be pleased because some musician was depressed about 60 years ago, and this year it's fashionable again. We've always suspected that a warm meal in a good book in an ugly, delightful chair might be shallow. I, for one, know that I have terrible taste in, <clears throat> in movies, that I like airplane paperbacks and prote uh, potato chips, but there will always be a cherished space for someone who can identify the bullshit. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Tanish, Manaz, Dena. This is why we do it, right? Take care. Thank you, Mike. I don't see Kenny anywhere. He's in the back. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, John. Everybody, take care.